Welcome to a fresh start, everyone. It is already September of 2022. Amazing, this year has been flying by. Summer is behind us, and we are all back engaged in that typical school schedule or transition into the work plans. Now, many of you know this is a big fall for us coming up at Nutridyne. Um, every fall, we have the opportunity to pull together some of the best clinicians um, around on some of the hottest topics, and we bring them to our stage. And this year, we are so excited to be back in person again for the uh, Great Lakes Conference. It'll be the 20th annual Great Lakes Conference coming up here in Minneapolis. So um, so all of you know, make sure you're checking your calendars. Uh, you're looking at your end of October dates, but we're basically heading on into one of our biggest events of the year. So I love our topic today, and our speaker today is so inspiring. Uh, we're going to be able to get down into the weeds today and really talk about some practical takeaways of balancing um, issues in your clinical practice with your patients who are dealing with all of the amazing sequelae that tend to come off of challenges with genetics. And, and I love your topic, Andrew. We got Dr. Andrew Rosenberg with us today. And you know what's so wonderful about his approach is he's going to look at the beyond genetics. You know, I love this approach because people can get so hung up on what their genetic predispositions are. And I love love the way you use the root cause approach to really dig in and get into what are some of the underlying causes that are impacting various different methylation disorders and, and smart ways to manage it. So, Andrew, it is great to have you here. Welcome to A Fresh Start. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Christy. I'm really uh, looking forward to our chat today. All right. Well, we've spent a lot of time um, with our chief science officer, uh, Rick Mayfield. Last month, we were highlighting Monique Class. You know, we've had a beautiful summer over the course of a fresh start. We've spent a lot of time looking at detox pathways, talking about hormone metabolism, looking at some of these very important roles that methylation can play and looking at the estrogen metabolism downstream cascades. And, and I love where we're jumping in our discussion with you today. This is this is your jam. Like this is your this is your baby. This is a you could probably teach methylation disorders in your sleep, right? So you know, yeah, there, there's a there's a higher degree of nerdiness coming out of my brain on this subject. I'm not gonna lie. So I love it. I love it. So let's just open up to some of the audience might not know who you are. You've been a wonderful speaker with the Nutridyne team. You're a part of the AK training series that kicks off here again in 2023. Tell them a little bit about your background. A little bit about your recent publications, the books that you have authored, and then let's just kind of dive in and let's have a great clinical conversation. Sounds great. Yeah. So um, I'm a chiropractor and a kinesiologist. I like to work with my hands. If I didn't put my hands on people and uh, touch bodies, I'd probably, you know, pull what's left of my hair out because I just I need I need that energy and that connection with with other people. But um, I'm also, you know, a, a kind of a graduate of the Nutridyne Academy, if you will, and I spent a lot of years learning everything I could from, uh, you know, the teachers like Rakowski and then uh, other big lectures that were coming through Minneapolis. And so I, you know, did everything, went to every seminar I could as a student. And I, I heard the word methylation years ago. And I remember that I had some indicators on my x-ray report, like spina bifida, occulta, and a few other things that were somehow related to this issue. And, and it just, it's the problems that uh, methylation can cause, they're in my family line. And you're always trying to doctor yourself a little bit. So that, that word methylation really just ignited some curiosity in me. And I love, I love challenges. I love to bang my head against really big, heavy brick walls. So I thought, Hey, what better subject to do that with than methylation? And, and so I just tried to learn everything I could about it. And it's led to, you know, just a lot of good clinical success, frankly. And I've been fortunate um, in that path to connect with people from like 20 different countries and People from all over the country have uh, reached out to pick my brain, so to speak, and get get second opinions and get a, ideas on how they can move forward when their their metabolism, their physiology is stuck. And it's it, knowing being fluent, I will say, at the basics of how the genetic systems work, and then being fluent in how the environment really stresses those pathways has paid huge dividends for me and my patients. And I love the idea of having more people doing it because it's just rewarding work. Beautiful. So I, I love this graphic. You know, I love the beautiful wheel that you bring forward. I know this is one of your creations. And so, you know, many who enter the world of nutrition, you know, and we clearly have in our Nutridyne family of our practitioners, we have some who have been there in the trenches for 30 years. 
right? And we've got some who have just been finding their way into integrative and functional and nutrition-based medicine in the last few months in this last year. So if you were going to have the talk with a new doc to the nutrition world, um, would you just kind of give that big picture high level and kind of bring them onto the map, if you would? I mean, many people are familiar with MTHFR and looking at activated forms of folic acid, but the story is so much bigger than just that one component and that one enzyme. So bring us onto the map. Yeah, so I think the idea in practice, again, whether you're a seasoned gray-haired veteran or you're fairly green, you're looking for leverage. You're looking for understanding the big picture because if you get it right at 30,000 feet and then you drill into the weeds, you're on target. But if you're off at 30,000 feet, no, no matter how far you drill down, you're never getting to, uh, to hit pay dirt, so to speak. And so methylation controls some very important critical pathways in our system. You mentioned detoxification. So it's, it's a big player in that pathway, but even more as well as those slides uh, that we'll go over here shortly show, I really keyed into methylation from the point of view that simply patients come to doctors because they do not feel well. They typically have a neurological mental headspace change from, you know, feelings of anxiety, fatigue, depression. Um, and they typically also have gastrointestinal complaints. I think if we survey the average practice functional or otherwise, these are the top complaints that we see. And the good news is that methylation helps explain how this is transpiring in our patients' lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of the big picture to, to take away from stepping into this subject matter is to realize that genes are fixed at the moment of conception but they are controlled through epigenetics. Yeah. And when you realize the gut is the biggest influence epigenetically into the liver, because what does the liver do? But basically it's main, main job to keep us alive is detoxify the bowel. Yeah. Um, there's other, obviously there's a lot that the liver does, but it, it, it's positioned at the receiving end of the portal vein. It has a huge job to do to detoxify the bowel. So what's going on in the gut translates into how these, SNPs we have in these genetic tendencies, some enzymes going too fast, some enzymes going too slow, they're being modified by our gut environment, by our overuse of antibiotics, by our stress, by our lack of sleep, GMO foods. And so when you look at it through that lens, I mean, to me anyway, it simplified functional medicine for me without making it like a cook, just a cookie cutter approach, but it helps you have confidence to get it, to get started with patients. Cause I think that's the biggest challenge with doctors is just, they don't, there's just a lack of confidence out there. And I wish we need a lot more doctors doing this. There's, there's a huge unmet need. Yeah. So there's this big, important story, right? That connects to cardiovascular, to brain health and protection and fertility and miscarriage rates, right? We're looking at this amazing array of different types of clinical conditions that can come back to the story of methylation. So when you um, are looking at a family history or you're scanning somebody's familial lineage, what are some of the big ahas that you see that make you think, yep, I'm going to be looking a little bit closer at their methylation status? So originally when methylation came on the radar, it was an awareness that methylation by being unsupported can raise homocysteine and create cardiovascular disease trajectories in families where people in their 40s and 50s were having 100%, you know, 99% occlusions of their left anterior descending artery when they're in their late 30s suffering from strokes and heart attacks, uh, also the, the relationship to cancer, because when genes that, because methylation plays such a big role in turning genes on and off, if you hypomethylate throughout your body, the odds of a cancer gene not being methylated go up. And then when that unmethylated gene is, is transcribed, it becomes activated. So you look at cancer, you look at and, uh, heart disease, and you look at depression because of the relationship that methylation has with neurotransmitters. So you get this wonderful like leverage and insight into where neurotransmitters come from. And methylation is the rate limiting step to make all of our monoamines, our catecholamines, serotonin, literally the rate limiting step is methylation. So that takes care of that huge, that includes that big category of patients with depression, anxiety, fatigue, Mm -hmm. uh, low, you know, they're falling asleep in the afternoon, even people with cravings. So there's just, yeah. there's so much to this, but those are the big keys, the big tells heart disease, cancer, and depression in a family line. 
And I love that you've been touching base on the links that go back to the gut, right? Because that's just like such a central anchor as somebody's gut health is such a key component of that gut brain connection in ways that we understand so much more today than we did 10, 20 years ago. But there's yet so many more questions to be answered, right? As we continue to mature in medicine. So this, I think, is a, is a big and important takeaway because many practitioners express that they get concerned or nervous when they work with methylated B vitamins and they give them to patients who are struggling with methyl concerns, who might also happen to have, say, catechol methyltransferase issues or a secondary enzyme concerns, where, you know, you can be feeding and supporting that production. Um, and if we are building and feeding the creation of all of the dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine family, sometimes the challenge is in their compromisation and their ability to then metabolize and clear those catecholamines, right? Because some patients take B vitamins and they get anxious, they get jittery, they feel like their skin is crawling. And that is such a big aha, uh -huh, right? That, oh my, we've got to look at, it's not just a methylation complication on the front end, but we've got other downstream enzymes we've got to be mindful of. So kind of unpack this visual, because I think this is a very big topic um, that a lot of practitioners are talking about. How to use Bs, how to use methyl Bs, how much, and what are you watching for to give you more of that clinical decision tree? Okay, so I'm going to do a shameless self plug for a second. So this book in my hand is the that's the book I wrote in 2018. We just re released it again um, with some updates, but it's called Your Genius Body, and it and it just walks through the protocol of why I the book is written in logical order to answer this question you just brought up. So I also had patients who were convinced their testing of their genetics proved it to be the case that all their problems were due to having two copies of MTHFR. And if we just gave them enough B vitamins and doubled the dose and they went on Deplin and went on 15 milligrams, literally they'd be, feel like everything's fine. Um, yeah. We know that's not the case. Right. And so I had a few patients with bad reactions and I would, other patients were coming in having had bad reactions and knowing that the body never makes mistakes. It just communicates through symptoms. We're trying to understand what's the real tell here. What is this, what is this skin crawling, anxiety, heart pounding, insomnia reaction that people get when they take too many methyl groups? And it turns out, as this chart shows, you have the BH4 cycle. And it is, the BH4 um, uh, cycle here is the rate limiting step to the final production of a, of a neurotransmitter. And those symptoms they describe, the insomnia, the tachycardia, the, high, the panic attacks, the anxiety, the skin crawling, those are manifested through the system of neurotransmitters. It is a neurotransmitter excess that they're experiencing in the minutes and hours after a high dose of or an excessive dose for that person of sure. the methylated bees. And so it really becomes a question. We have a slide on this coming up that kind of shows it in simplistic form, but it's, you have to recognize in your mind when you're in this, working with this, uh, this uh, like philosophy, looking at genetics and epigenetics, you need to separate in your mind what chemical reactions are producing something. Mm -hmm. And then you need to understand in your mind what chemical reactions, which pathways, genetics are responsible for removing things. And I think that's a basic logical mm -hmm. understanding that we can teach people to attain yeah. because supplying B vitamins into the body also supplies them to the gut and bacteria and yeast will metabolize methylated Bs and it will speed up their metabolism also. So if you already have too much bacteria, uh, a hidden or occult mold or yeast overgrowth, and you sprinkle mitochondrial fertilizer all into your intestines, you are going to have perpendicular effects from that that are unsavory, you're going to have these strange symptoms. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I would, that's a big idea for me is recognizing methylation in terms of the brain chemistry is the key for production of the neurotransmitter, mm -hmm. specifically to MTHFR. There's a whole more, there's a more complicated and longer, more convoluted pathway to detoxify the neurotransmitter than there is to produce it. It's simpler to make, more difficult to get rid of just based off the chemical pathway and then you then you throw in the tendencies that people have, as you say, Christy, with mm -hmm. um, COMT, two copies of COMT, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, also SNPs and the aldehyde pathway. And you can start to see that that, you know, if you think of a basin that's filling up with water, the methylation is the, is the faucet bringing the neurotransmitter into the basin, filling the basin up. But then you have COMT and aldehydes and this elegant detox process as the drain. And so that drain gets clogged, essentially, and people... Are walking into doctor's offices, uh, you know, praying for help, trying mm -hmm. to understand it. 
Mm -hmm. Great analogy. Any big takeaways on the visual? Anything you want them to hone in on as we dive into the next set of all your slides? We're going to zoom in on the bottom right hand corner in the next few slides and kind of um, overlay what I think are the most important epigenetic things to keep in mind on the bottom right. So I, I'm biased. I'm just going to say it 100% that dopamine is the most important neurotransmitter in the human body. Mm -hmm. um, we only have a, yes. about 400,000 neurotransmitter uh, cells in our brain that produce dopamine out of 16 billion. So there's precious few cells that even make dopamine. And I think there was a study that came out a few weeks ago that basically blew the serotonin deficiency hypothesis out of the water. It was a 30 year kind of met major meta-analysis that said that high or low serotonin has no influence on depression. It was the Yes. Uh, I can provide, I can provide that reference. I, yeah, no, it was a big deal in social media, right? In every nutrition group and functional medicine group and integrates, it was nothing but this explosion of, we told you so, right? Totally. I mean, it was amazing, actually. I think it's, I'm thrilled that you, you made note of it. Dopamine, dopamine rules the roost. So this is what I yep. focus on dopamine and adrenaline, the, you know, the daughter chemicals that, that come yep. from that. Yeah. Ugh. Dopamine and oxytocin, man, they are that is like those, those two are my favorites. <laughs> you need some, right. but not too much. <laughs> exactly. That's what I love. It's the bell curve, right? It's that bell curve. All right. So why don't you break things down? Because I think your slide does a fabulous job letting our audience really recognize that it's, again, it's a spectrum that we're dealing with here and there's a happy sweet spot and that's not the same for everybody. It's not the same for everybody, but the kid, you know, Goldilocks is a true story. And even though she's biting her nails on this picture, the part of the curve that she's standing under, she's, she's going to have the best personality, the best sense of humor. She's going to plan her day, execute her tasks, uh, avoid uh, the erratic driver on the way to work. She's going to, she's going to, she's going to manifest her, her best human self because it's frontal lobe activity. And that's the seat of the soul. And it's the, it's the driver of our life having a good frontal lobe and that frontal lobe runs exclusively off of dopamine. Mm -hmm. So people genetically have a tendency to fall into either the left or right hand side of this curve. So when you look at the person on the left hand side um, of your screen with the blue star, mm -hmm. typically a male patient, not always, we're not going to be, you know, not trying to be sexist here, but based on the way that testosterone upregulates COMT and NAO, Men tend to fall into the low catecholamine category more often. This is where the ADD and ADHD, um, you know, diagnoses are more common by about a factor of three or four X for boys versus girls, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Addictions, substance abuse, anger. These are the main mm -hmm. symptom expressions of low dopamine. These are behaviors and life choices that are made by individuals seeking to raise dopamine as a form of self-medication. Mm -hmm. Because they're trying to move from left to right to get into the middle of the bell curve where they can experience that peace and that self-confidence of having a good frontal lobe and they can focus, they can pass the test at school, they can be function socially and in athletics and everything like that. And I'd say that's probably 30% maybe or 20% of who comes into my practice. And it's a phenotype that's out there. This is the person who um, would respond well to more therapeutic levels of methylfolate of choline, betaine, you know, L-tyrosine, these kind of things that help promote the activation and increase of dopamine. The people on the left-hand side of this curve, they do great with that. It's like, where have you been all my life? The adrenal adaptogens, all that stuff, it, it all kind of, it's all kind of categor categorically the same. Mm -hmm. Now, the right-hand side, this is a group of people who suffer and, and, and the screen isn't big enough to show this, but if you, if you keep pulling the the, the bell curve way off to the right, like maybe five or six standard deviations off to the right. Mm -hmm. The further right you go with high dopamine, you get you begin to get into situations where people experience manic issues. And even further out, you get uh, psychosis and schizoaffective disorders. And all the research I've ever seen, um, many, many uh, references I've collected over the years, all the medication that works for schizophrenia is trying to block dopamine. And dopamine creates hallucinations uh, hallucinations when it's really, really high. And so that's the spectrum. I'm being extreme just to mm -hmm. make a point, but what people are suffering with who have COMT SNPs, mm -hmm. people who have problems with glutathione, COMT, uh, glucuronidation, people who have those occult gut infections, it's clogging the drain in this basin. Mm -hmm. And as that basin fills up, as methylation keeps happening a billion times a second, 
filling that basin up, it starts to splash out. And as it splashes out, these are the kind of symptoms people experience. It might be insomnia. You can only sleep three or four hours a night. Yeah. And they couldn't take a nap to save their life. I meet people who've never napped in their whole life, Christy. Right. Right. How is that possible? Right. Yes. <laughs> Too yeah. much dopamine. And, and, yeah. Can't come down. Right. So this is where the adaptogens that are calming, like melatonin, L-theanine, uh, magnesium three and eight, uh, the, cannab the cannabinoids. Yeah. Um, there's lots of anti-dopaminergic uh, adaptogens and nutrients in the catalog from Nutridine. They work incredibly well. And, and my goal, of course, um, being the OCD human that God made me, I'd like to help pick the right tool for the right patient. So I built a model uh, to, to help me categorize people. It's not perfect, yeah. uh, but man, this has, again, been really effective at helping know which toolkit I'm going to reach for to help move the needle for this person. Love it. Well, let's keep going. Let's keep, keep seeing where this bell curve lies. Cool. So here's the big, second highest mountain in the world. K2. It's probably the most beautiful. It's just aesthetic deadly, but, but beautiful, but deadly. And the thing is I put some of the main genes that influence methylation on the left from the big, big picture that this is about building things. Um, Methylation does, of course, help with, you know, methylating two methoxy estrogens, and it does help in the methyl and the detox cycle of phase two, but it's certainly a minor contributor. Methylation is much, much, much more about building things. And this is again, why when you give high doses of B vitamins, you see those negative, strong, massive reactions. It doesn't mean you're a bad clinician. It means you need to look at, look at it differently. They're already making enough of what you help them make more of. And that's kind of getting to the top and getting to the top of a mountain is always easier and less dangerous than descending. You know, it's just harder to climb down than it is to climb up. Mm -hmm. And so on the right-hand side, we have those important detox phase two pathways that Christy has been mentioning. And so um, I, again, I need to be organized. I'm a visual learner. So I, I do stuff like this, but this, this kind of, this is the really big picture. Are you working on the left-hand side yeah. or the right-hand side of this curve? It's awesome. I think it's such a wonderful way to introduce the core concepts. And I, I love your teaching analogy. I think it's spot on. So here's, right, a, here's a busy slide. Okay. I love slides like this. They're my favorite. Okay. So if, if the audience would, would follow with me here. So at the top, you see the molecule norepinephrine. Now it's also called noradrenaline, depending if you want to use the Latin or the Greek uh, school. And it is the one chemical reaction away from dopamine. And then, so in other words, think of this, this could, this could have said dopamine at the top. In this case, I'm looking at it from the epinephrine point of view, but literally the chemical reactions in front of you going from the green box at the top to the uh, VMA molecule that I've circled at the bottom, that is the pathway your neurotransmitters take to be detoxified and end up in your urine. And dopamine does the exact same route. And what I've done is I've used arrows to show how complicated this pathway gets. As I, as I said, the detox side is just more complicated. And the arrows are showing which epigenetic factors that we could, we could work on clinically for, with functional medicine to, to either to unload those burdens. So for example, I have an arrow here that says yeast slows, right? Yeast produces ethanol. Every alcohol, every ever alcoholic beverage on earth ever consumed, as far as I know, was given to us courtesy of the action of yeast. Okay. So, um, it, sorry, it, it jumped without me touching. I think. You're, good. You're good. So, so those brown arrows on your screen are just showing you which genes are going to get extra clogged up, extra epigenetically burdened with more substrate when you have a, an occult fungal overgrowth or even a mold exposure. And that begins to make that drain in that basin we're talking about smaller. Then you look at gut, uh, bacterial phenols, the red arrow. This is where a small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And again, it could just be an overgrowth of healthy bacteria, but healthy bacteria don't need to be five standard deviations elevated from normal. Because when that happens, you get a big influx of phenols from the portal vein into the liver and they take the parking spaces away from dopamine and from adrenaline. And so dopamine and adrenaline are going around the block waiting for their opportunity to sit in that parking space because of the gut phenol problem. And that's where I was led in my practice and research to kind of get real big into identifying and screening for bacterial overgrowth and everything like that. But that's just, this map just shows you 
graphically, that's what you're looking at. So the red arrows and the brown arrows and the pink. So you have red, brown, and pink. You have gut, uh, bacteria, yeast, and estrogens. They all conspire to make the detoxification of catecholamines slower. That's, that's the world we live in. Um, so we can look at all of those uh, clinically and help change the environment, and then those genes work faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what about testosterone? So testosterone is, as I mentioned briefly before, it goes the opposite of estrogen, and it actually upregulates and increases the activity of COMT and MAO. And so this is, again, um, in general, generality speak, men and boys tend to have more of that low catecholamine um, personality, behavioral expression, and challenges. Because just being a healthy male with you know, healthy testosterone levels, your half-life of dopamine is less than maybe your, your mother or your, your wife or your sister who has higher levels of estrogen. I mean, literally if you have the same genetics and one was a, one, one male person and one female, the female will have a, a, a longer half-life of, of dopamine than the male. And so it's almost like estrogen is a bit of an antidepressant, which is kind of cool. And, and it, there's, there's an advantage to having dopamine. The, the problem is it's a double-edged sword. When you have too much, it's, it works against us. And of course I've experienced in my life for many years, not having enough dopamine. That's why I'm maybe so passionate about this stuff. Cause when you fix it, it's really life-changing for people, but there's a diff there's a sexual dichotomy between men and women having tendencies to go high and low dopamine as a general rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great guide. Really very insightful. Okay. So let's talk about the further connections. Okay. So this is maybe a little more nerdy than, than the other slides. This was built in response to the idea that someone will raise their hand in these classes I've taught. And I've, I've been teaching people, doctors and clinicians, how to apply this science now for the past about six years. And, you know, you make a, any rule that comes up, there's always a, a time to break that rule. But sometimes people will have most of the symptoms on the high catecholamine side, and then they'll sometimes have really bad cravings, like their catecholamines are low. And it's like, how do we understand this? And I'm not going to get too into the weeds because I really could just make everybody's eyes glass over, but I'm just going to say one thing here on this. This is basically describing that when you have high dopamine and it floods into your brain, your brain doesn't have really the ability to control the release of dopamine once it's been released. There's no way to suck it back up in the synapse. You're kind of like, if you have a big stress bomb in your life, you're going to get a big dopamine hit and there's nothing you can do about it. So your brain is really clever and it removes receptors. So you have this play with your brain and, and, and the brain's trying to figure out like, is this a high dopamine world I live in or a low dopamine? So it loves a steady supply, mm -hmm. but it will try to remove receptors on your brain to adapt to high dopamine situations because that's the only way it can kind of calm the signal down. And conversely, if you're stuck in a low dopamine situation for weeks on end, your brain keeps making new receptors, trying to grab that rare dopamine molecule. And then all of a sudden, if something really crazy and stressful does happen, you might swing all the way to the other side and experience some of those high catecholamine symptoms. But it's not that that's who you are as a phenotype. It's because you've been low for so long. Your body's so thirsty. It made so many receptors, just a little bit of dopamine amp the signal up mm -hmm. again. That's basically so, what this describes. So I love that. So in that analogy, if someone were low, they're diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, they've certainly met many of the symptom patterns that you see with the low profile, but say they're an athlete or they go big, right? Like they do big, big things. They jump off mountains. They, they're hardcore, right? And so they have these life epigenetic influences, right? Where they have these incredible moments that sort of wash over their system. Can that tip them into the category of insomnia or now I can't sleep? Or can the situation or the environment bring them forward into the description you're just beautifully unpacking? No, absolutely, Christy. I mean, how cool is it? two nerdy people can talk about this subject um, so, so easily. Like, it's just kind of fun, you know? Um, it is but fun. Is, <laughs> but, but as you said, I mean, this is really the root cause behind addiction. So, you know, the person who jumps off a mountain with a wingsuit attached yeah. used to climb the jungle gym at the playground and get high from that. But, yep. you know, the search for dopamine is really what rules the people's lives. It's just, a, that's the lens I've tried to look at people through and it's just, it's yep. one of many ways to look at people, but um, gosh, that quest for dopamine 
can drive people to incredible links. And yes, if they go too big, they're training too hard, they can, they can have those, they can have a bad night, a bad spell of sleep, even though they're usually the sleepy one who takes naps all the time. So yes. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Oh, I wish this was like an eight hour day. Okay. So <laughs> going back around, um, let's talk a little bit about folate metabolism. Yeah. So why would a chiropractor even be into this stuff? I mean, I think that's a fair question to ask. And um, again, it just came from this connection, this realization that methylation was really important. I got my x-ray report back and I had normal variants and being, you know, being a smart, a smart A type person, I was like, well, is it normal or is it a variant? You know, come on, what's the deal here? Well, it was actually when I was in utero for some period of time, I don't know if it was five hours or five days, there wasn't enough folate around and my neural tube didn't quite close all the way left with a little bit of a uh, work undone, but it wasn't, you know, it was 98% done. So I'm okay. And I grew up and everything's been fine. And so knowing about that pathway, I, I found this reference and it kind of summarize the whole issue, I think, for chiropractors or really any medical professional who is going to look at people. You're looking at symmetry. You're looking at body shape. But folate is so unique in, in the biochemical world. It says it right here that folate metabolism literally influences the final form of any growing tissue. And I'm just like, it's elegantly simple. Deviations from symmetry, spina bifida, cleft palate, uh, pectus excavatum, pectus carnatum, short legs, hemivertebrae, all these things that we learn about in chiropractic college and other medical disciplines, um, they have a methylation component. And we, they're telling the story of this lineage's biochemistry, whether they're getting enough nutrients through the expression of these variants. So that's kind of how I, I look at it, you know? Great interpretation. So let's look at those a little closer. So again, being visual, here's just for your own kind of... Um, edification, you can see like spina bifida, for example, is a spectrum. And on the left, you have a culta. That's what I found on, on my x-ray. And then as the, as the deficiency of methylation in utero is increased, the expression of the midline defect gets more extreme. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know what month or week in gestation, all of this is happening. I do know that it's really probably in the beginning, because like when you look down at scoliosis, uh, for example, some people have like an extra vertebrae or they have, an, they have like half a vertebrae uh, at, at L3 that they're not supposed to have or at T4. So there was an extra somite that was made during the very early stages of growth, first couple of weeks of life. And mm -hmm. it's just like in our society, are we really that healthy? Are women who of childbearing age, are they taking care of their epigenetics and are they aware of this? And if we could go back in time and, and serve that population and help them make some changes, then we would see much lower rates of these kind of spinal defects because of the changes that we would be making into her body. And so the environment and the baby, the baby would get enough methyl groups so you wouldn't see these errors, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but again, Down syndrome, um, like we saw, but here's just another visual with cleft palate. I mean, it's life-threatening without, without surgical intervention, you know, cleft palates is life-threatening. Children can't nurse. And we just look at cleft palate as a neurotube defect on the face. It's just the same. It's a, right in the midline. Uh, same kind of thing with Marfan syndrome. And um, again, this awareness of fetal alcohol syndrome, we, there's sort of a physical visual phenotype that we've all maybe learned about and accepted that some people who are fetal alcohol syndrome individuals, they have maybe a different visual phenotype. And that's again, folate is disrupted by ethanol, by alcohol. Mm -hmm. And because the alcohol is affecting methylation, then the fit, the final physical shape or form of the person is some tells that story, so to speak, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and again, just different, different things we see in practice, Arnold Chiari malformations. I mean, if part of the nervous system is found outside of the skull, uh, we treat that like a methylation problem in utero. It's just a similar of a similar nature in the midline to spina bifida, horseshoe kidneys, dysfunctions with cell division go back to methylation deficiencies. There's just not enough of those labile methyl groups available in the environment in the uterus when these babies are growing and these little tiny things happen. And, and luckily life's so diverse, it can and adapt, but um, leg link discrepancy, um, and then I think there's one, is there one more page on this or is that, was that? Yep. Yep. One more. Yeah. So one more. So then like congenital heart malformation is a good example. 
Again, the heart is midline, a midline defect. And ironically, CHM is, the way we think about it is like this, like, you know, a baby takes about 40 weeks to complete. It's a nine month process. And that heart, when it's born, when, when babies are born with CHM, they're born with a heart that might be six and a half or seven months old, but the baby itself is, is nine. And so met, slow methylation is the responsible party because without enough methyl groups being delivered to growing baby, the body couldn't complete the, the construction process in the, in the allotted time. And, and this is also a spectrum because some children born with CHM, it will close naturally. They will start nursing and sleeping and it can catch up and close the form um, in the form in ovale there, mm -hmm. or, or it becomes a surgical emergency or a surgical issue uh, a little later on. And so I just, I use those because we're familiar with them, but those are, so these methylation issues are not just the weird far corner of functional medicine. They're like in everybody's life in family trees, they're walking into our practice all the time. Yeah, so front and center, right. In many cases, front and center. Here's an old reference. This is back from 1977, but again, they're, they were looking at homocysteinuria, a downstream um, evidence of methylation and folate issues, and they were already noticing um, changes to the palate, changes to symmetry. So mm -hmm. good, good thing to be familiar with in clinic because, you know, you don't want to point your finger at a patient and say, wow, you really have a messed up methylation phenotype, but you want right. to see those things in front of you with your eyes as part of your clinical picture, and that points you to making sure that base gets covered. Great. So let's talk labs, right? So if you are suspicious, you've got a patient presenting and you're kind of wanting to pull the pieces together, what is your standard workup and what are the types of things that you're going to be looking for in those profiles? Okay. So I try to get the most lab work done with the least, uh, inv you know, I try to be, let's say, leverage my time and my, in my patient's investment. So I do a basic, like I'll do homocysteine, I'll do a CBC with diff looking at the, um, the red blood cell MCV level, making sure homocysteine's in range, kind of just a general liver kidney panel. Mm -hmm. um, on some difficult cases, there's a laboratory in New Jersey called Health Diagnostics Research Institute, HDRI. And they provide the most in-depth methylation panel that I've ever seen. It's kind of all experimental. I think they say that to CYA, mm -hmm. but uh, they will give you all the different metabolites RBC, blood serum, um, and it's been helpful clinically in some difficult cases, but for the average person who isn't, you know, um, an, an, a child who is maybe vaccine injured and regressed and lost verbal, for example, that'd be a good patient you want to do the bigger methylation panel with. Okay. Um, for most metabolic syndrome, back pain, um, headache, insomnia, American, so to speak, yeah. using basic blood work, always checking homocysteine, um, I, you know, I do that. And, and then of course there's a genetic testing, but to me, it's a, there's a privacy issue with genetic testing and it's not something I push on patients. I educate them about it. If they, if there's a case to be made that they should do it, I'll, I'll tell them about it. But most people bring me the test before I even tell them. So that's kind of how my practice works. So it's like, they're already into it. They want to figure it out. And a lot, I think there were last time I checked Christy, it was like more than 30 million, you know, Americans have done their genetic testing. Yeah. And I was a couple of years old. It's like an exponential explosion of people testing their ancestry. So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely on the rise. So let's talk a little bit about organic acids, right? So if you are looking to make this differentiation and you're wanting to look low versus high, you know, like what are some of the big things you're going to be looking for on your, on your lab panels? Thank you for redirecting me. That's what I, no, we need to talk about organic no. acid, right? You no, know, I want to hear what you got to yeah. say. <laughs> so here's, a, here's the, the, the basic idea with organic acids is this. I needed a way to test a theory that phenols were making my patients react negatively mm -hmm. to beef, to methylfolate and B vitamins. We're talking people with two copies of MTHFR, all the genetic indications, but they could not tolerate B vitamins. They even still had high homo, like they had high homocysteine. We couldn't therapeutically work on it. So the organic acid test, the one I use is from Great Plains, and it gives me 10 different phenol markers on their test. It gives me nine fungal and mold markers, three oxalate markers. That right there pays for it. Yep. Then you have all this other stuff with ketones and mitochondrial levels. And, and then also it tests the, uh, the residue of dopamine and, and adrenaline in the urine. So from that one test, you can leverage so much information off that one organic acid test, and it helps you 
you'll see on the organic acid test, and this is probably, I think, the first test to start with in, for those just starting with functional medicine to get basic blood labs and an organic acid test on your challenging patients because the organic acid test finds problems mm -hmm. that the stool tests do not find. I think stool tests basically take a picture of the colon mm -hmm. and maybe some other stuff that came, you know, there's some, some argument we could be making there, but it can't measure the quantity of bacteria like an organic acid can, which is awesome. So you'll see phenols off the chart high on people. Then, you know, you direct them towards SIBO and working on FODMAP diets and cleaning up their gut. And it literally changes people's lives or it changes their mental landscape by working on the hidden infection. Mm -hmm. What do you think about binders? Are there certain binders that you've worked with or do they play a role for you in your clinical care? They do binders, you know, they keep people from having Herx reactions. I have a reference that shows in the average person's gut, there's enough endotoxin. If it could be put into a syringe, it would kill a thousand other people. Oh my gosh. Now that is a normal, healthy human. Yeah. So when we start slaughtering excess bacteria and nuking them, we don't need extra lipopolysaccharides flooding into people's lives. So the binders help in that regard. Um, I, I use coffee enemas very frequently. That also helps. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, binders are part of the protocol. Take them at night away from food, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Know. So let's talk top down, right gut. So a lot of what I've heard you say um, and your clinical approach is you're absolutely going to work your way through the gut. You're going to look for fungus. You're going to look for yeast. You're going to look for SIBO. So what are some of the ways that you manage that? Well, we do the organic acid test. Uh, we look at tongues. We look at, you know, we look at the clinical picture, physical exam, neurologic exam, and we go for stomach acid. We use a lot of pain. I use a lot of stomach acid support. I, I work from the point of view, Christy, that if people had a functional, healthy gut, they wouldn't be in my office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got all the data on why people make no stomach acid under stress. It's Hans Selye 101. The gut, the stomach just gets absolutely obliterated with stress. We're the most stressed out group of people maybe to ever live on earth. So Stomach acids, number one, I use a lot of pancreatic enzymes. I use lipoflow uh, a lot for, you know, up gallbladder support. I try to make sure that trifecta of stomach, gallbladder, and pancreas does its job. Awesome. And yeah. then we, yep. Yeah, then we use, you know, bug killers. And I like to rotate. I usually pick four bug killers, break them into pairs, have them take them for four days, one pair, and then switch to the other. Um, works really well. And probiotics are amazing, everybody, but they're not the best for your SIBO patients. So knowing when to use probiotics becomes a, a yeah. good clinical uh, idea. I, I love that you're saying that and even prebiotics, right? Because sometimes, you know, you just putting in probiotics and prebiotics and all of a sudden, boom, they're like, I'm five months pregnant. What just happened here? Oh, well, that's good news. That's information, right? Because of we're course. eating the SIBO. So, okay. So we'll pull back. So you're right. It's all about timing and order and, you know, using probiotics, using quality fibers, using, you know, various formulas we use to treat leaky gut and intestinal permeability that may have a bunch of those prebiotics in it's sometimes too fast, too quick, right? And their gut's not prepared to handle it. Amen. And yes, like you just said, when patients have bad reactions, it's not a judgment on you as a bad clinician. And it's not because they didn't follow your directions and it's not because they need to double the dose. Throw those ideas out the window, that's BS. Yes. It's good information and it tells you how to do the next thing. And I've never had a patient get mad at me because they got bloated based off a recommendation. Mm hmm it's great. I love it. It's next, it's your clinical decision tree, right? So obviously kind of one of the staples, uh, if we're going to look at options for supporting the gut top down, you know, Nutridyne's Digestive Complete does somewhat stand out in the marketplace because there are not that many uh, formulas out there that will integrate the ox bile and will take that extra look at supporting some of the lipase um, and lipid regulation. So um, what else are you using? Um, this is a great all around to really jumpstart stomach acid production. Um, there's of course straight HCL, there's multiple different enzyme formulas and kind I've of talked about how do you pick or choose amongst them? So I'm again, being OCD that I am, I, I like to have my, my stereo system with bat lows, mediums, and highs separate so I can adjust. So I go and I, I make sure I give, I start with stomach acid by itself so I can fine tune it. Same thing with pancreatic enzymes. And then with, you know, a product for bile support, like lipo flow, or I use, I use a lot of stress essentials relax. It's a great gallbladder product too. But okay, once people, once, pe line. Yeah, once great. people, okay. once people get, see the change and the needles moving and they have that positive momentum, they don't yeah. want to have three bottles to have to deal with. Digestive complete covers the bases, but again, I'm in my population, I'm, I'm trying to be really aggressive, thorough, get it all, get, do as good a deep clean as I can get everything working as well as I can. Then weeks later, we'll switch them to something simple like digestive complete. 
Yep. So, Good. Great, great flow. So let's talk about lipo flow. This is, I think, a hidden gem. I think it is so commonly that people forget about that whole phase of preclinical patterns before the gallbladder needs to come out or the stone is there, right? I mean, biliary efflux is like such an important part of the the, the cleaning system, you know, of our of our of our gut integrity. So talk about when do you use it? How do you use it? How do you dose? Um, what what are going to be those points in the patients who may not be coming in with an acute gallbladder case? And you're going to be throwing lipoflow into the program. Yep. So, you know, this is like stage three detox. Like you were mentioning, stage two is happening in the liver, physically getting the garbage out of your body, urinating, defecating, and squeezing bile out of the gallbladder is pretty much phase three. So this is really a phase three. This yeah. helps with that. Um, I, you know, you, you got to know your patients. You have to do good basic clinical uh, histories, talk about floating poop and fat intolerance and histories in the family. The gallbladder is without question the most methylation sensitive organ in the human body, which is why they get destroyed so fast. Um, I have a great reference on like basically like 70% of all methylation reactions are just to produce choline. And really? that there's 70% of all efflux through a donation of SAMe is to make choline molecules. I'll try to, I'll send that to you, Christy. Um, yeah. So you, you, you see how important that choline production is for making bile uh, like viscous of the right kind so it can leave the gallbladder. So lipoflow really helps to, it does really two things in my mind. It helps when you're eating fat, I have them take it in the middle of the meal. It acts like an ox bile type product that helps you mycelize and like a detergent, bring those fats in that you've just eaten all those healthy fish oils and yeah. good, clean grass fed animal fats and stuff. Yeah. And then when those nutrients in this get into your liver, it helps the liver thin the bile so it runs faster. That's kind of the way uh, it works in, in, in our practice, so. Great, great analogy. What about GI integrity? How do you, what's your relationship with the GI integrity formula? So I, I default to giving people small doses of HCL to do a challenge um, to see how their body responds to HCL on an, almost every patient. And some people raise their hand and go, man, that didn't feel good. I couldn't even take one, it was uncomfortable. And I never like creating pain in patients unnecessarily, but that just is a good tell to say, well, we just discovered you have a form of gastritis. So now I'm going to put you on GI integrity. And yeah. so it's, it's almost like if you use the HCL to screen your patients, you'll get 90% of people tolerating it. And about 10% in my experience don't tolerate it. That 10% has like an active gastritis and this is great. So I have them I do the trick where you put a water bottle together and you put a couple scoops in it and you sip it for like six hours, then you fill it back up and two more scoops because I'd rather they do a hundred small doses than three big ones. Awesome. What a great, I mean, these demulsants are phenomenal. I mean, looking at kind of the evolution of these types of programs and products over time, you know, the anchors always have been sort of that L-glutamine and looking at the support with the DGL and the aloe, but I think Nutridyne did a brilliant job with adding in all these other phenomenal, you know, mucilaginous supporting demulsants that are there. You know, this herbal formula, you know, it just soothes and it coats and from everything from esophageal inflammation all the way down through that gastric irritation. This is one of my go to's and I am so clinically impressed with the results and, you know, obviously use it too with patients where food triggers are there, right? Where we know that there's foods that it may be a sensitivity, it might just be a aflatoxin, or it might be, you know, some other type of a food trigger, like you've mentioned before. And I just find this is one of my favorite products. And it tastes good. And that really helps with compliance. No, it's super yummy. <laughs> it's good. Uh, probiotics. We got a ton of them, you know, um, over at, in the Nutridyne store. There's a lot of great resources and options. It seems like every few months we're dropping another one in um, from the powders that can be integrated and utilized, especially in the pediatric market, all the way through some of the new advanced formulas. Which ones do you dabble with and why? Yeah, I think my number one go-to is ultrabiotic uh, multi-strain. It's just, I love having the Saccharomyces in there. Um, ultrabiotic completes pretty close in formula. Um, I doing all these organic acid tests, like I was saying earlier to you on the phone, I've, I've probably seen over a thousand of them over the past, you know, six or seven years. So I've seen a lot. And sometimes people come back and they have like biome, uh, depression. Like there's literally nothing growing in their gut, uh, based on this test. So I love using probiotics aggressively and especially cases like that probiotics that, you know, Neutrodine's always had this, uh, relationship with the strain identification. Everything is just scientifically genetically tested. So I know what's on the labels and the product. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had such good results 
uh, seeing those test chains and rein, like reinvigorating the biome and seeing those probiotics survive the transit. Yeah. Um, but definitely multi strain is a big go to. I use a lot of ultrabiotic defense as well. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to fight. I spend a lot of time fighting bugs, uh, Christy. Sure. So, you know, I'm in the bug war uh, I love zone it. a lot. <laughs> yeah. What about the old standard foundational functional foods, right? So, uh, there's a couple that, you know, become anchors for a lot of practitioners in nutrition. They often have a detox go to and an anti inflammatory. I am heavily tipped in the Inflamese family. I love the Inflamese product. It probably flies off my shelf more than most other things. Um, what do you think about and how do you use the detox formulas and at what point and dosing, right? If we're kind of coming back to talking about these kind of ultra sensitive methylation cases at times, what do you do as you gently get people moving forward with a detox program? I got to say the most frustrating patients in practice are the ones who are super sensitive and the error that clinics, here's the error that clinicians make. You have a great product that works on 87 people and you have two people come in that they react to. And then you go, well, the exception now is going to change the rules. So it's no longer a great product. I had two people that reacted to it. I'm just like, ah, bad logic guys, bad logic. So um, no, you know, no, being, no. A, being a Rikowski student, um, he proved his point with his seven day detox and his results. And I've followed in his footsteps, co- you copy your teachers and that's the best compliment you can give. Um, so I use a lot of, I had a few seven days go out this week with people who are dealing with estrogen toxicity with the hormone balance. Um, people with, you know, Crohn's di- diagnoses, they're getting the inflammies of course. Um, but the, the sensitive patients guys, as a general rule, here's just what I want you to take away. When patients respond in a strange way to a supplement and they have a bad reaction, it's not the supplement till proven otherwise. It could be that something in their guts, eating the nutrition in the supplement, off gassing something that's flaring them up for a few hours, do an organic acid test, and you come back to that detox process later. People with hidden gut infections can't even get good detox until you've helped the bi- microbiome get healthier. Then you can go deeper in their body and really make changes. Perfectly well stated. And sometimes I find too, of these formulas, I mean, they've been around for over 20 years, right? Since Dr. Bland came out with the first, very old, original, old ultra clear that many of us played with 20 plus years ago, right? And sometimes it's dose dependent, right? Like you can't just throw in a scoop a day and get started. Some patients need like a quarter of a scoop. They need a flick of, you know, they need a flick. I mean, it's amazing when you see how impactful it can be for individuals with that genetic susceptibility, a little goes a long way. So I, I, I like to, you know, I, I certainly, I end up with a lot of the, I did the seven day detox and my patient got way worse. They just kick them over to me, you know, to go figure out what happened. So (laughs) I do, I see a lot of those, right. And it's like, you kind of know right out of the gate, if, if that's the case, you're dealing with some kind of a genetic epigenetic interface, right. And so very much like, you know, within a couple of days, you know, if somebody really needs to pull back and slow down. So I just wanted to hear, I love love your commentary because it isn't a lot of those patients and it's wonderful to use a seven day detox every so often you are going to have patients who get worse or feel horrific from it. And that is clinical insight, right? Go slow, go low and dig deeper and do more detective work. Amen. Yeah. Well, I love that you mentioned hormone balance. I put this on my top five. I love this product. My patients love this product. Um, we use it a lot. Um, clearly, it's, it's, I think, one of the best on the market um, in looking at the ability to support estrogen modulation in so many different ways. How do you use it? And what is your clinical experience? I mean, I think that the estrogen detoxification toolkit that Nutridyne has with hormone balance as the, the main tip of the spear is almost it's almost cheating when it comes to hormone balancing problems great way to say i mean i've had women literally bleeding through they've had a menstrual cycle for four months straight two weeks off four months straight going on for five years i've been to 15 doctors they do they go through a couple bottles of hormone balance and they have a normal cycle for a year every 28 days i'm just like that is potent uh phytonutrition good epigenetics uh, yeah so we have a great catalog uh, and i love that it's called hormone balance because the old products we used to use were always pink and you try to get guys to take it. Yeah. And yep. they should have made a camouflage one with a Harley Davidson symbol on it. And then the guys would have taken it. Oh my gosh. I totally love it. 
hilarious. No, it is so true. You know, that's our, our beauty of having, you know, Rick Mayfield on the back end, right, as our chief science officer. I mean, he's a genius. We all know that Rick is an amazing genius. I think this is one of the best formulas, you know, in the lineup. It is so unique. There's nothing like this, you know, that we see out there uh, in the powdered form, the way it works with the gut. Uh, it just does a, a beautiful job in, in our clinical patients. So we tend to come back and a lot of the interviews I have every single month, Andrew, it's surprisingly, not surprisingly, come back to people saying hormone balance is one of my favorites, you know, uh, this, it's this a, one for it's, it's like cheating. It's so good. The, 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 the detoxification of estrogen is so effective. It's, it's almost like a, it's amazing. So yeah, yeah. it is so effective. Well, we talked a little bit already about sleep aids and formulas out, you know, looking at liposomal alpheanine. Um, there's of course, looking at options to, we don't, one thing we didn't say is in that anxiety rich environment, where are you using things like say, uh, the, Stress Essentials Calm, right? Our new GABA, that's just straight GABA. How do you pull that in to your neurotransmitter story? So I usually have a handful of things. Um, like I have kind of my favorite five. It usually is like, I use a lot of niacinamide because it doesn't flush and it's a cofactor for breaking down dopamine. So I'll hit them with, you know, maybe two, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams of niacinamide QD that we already mentioned, theanine, the melatonin, the magnesium threonate. So, you know, calm ease is another one that, that I like to add in when people really can't fall asleep. I like to use cortisol pro and give them oh, one yeah. capsule for five hours in a row in the five hours preceding their sleep. Love that dosing. It is a total hidden gem. That is a phenomenal product. Cortisol I like to pro. carpet. I like to carpet bomb people, Christy. That's good. <laughs> I like the drip. It's like a very nice micro dosing drip strategy to get them, get them down at night. It's awesome. Good, good approach. All right. If they wanted to find you, are you taking new patients? Do you do any distance work? Do you have to walk in the door to see you? How do they connect? Just reach out to my practice, uh, uh, Red Mountain Clinic. You know, we do we do telemedicine. We do in office. We have people traveling. We have a big community here in Idaho. We it's it's there's lots of ways to work together. And if you're a practitioner and you like our like my philosophy and the the kind of the, the approach that I've shared today. Uh, there'll be some information about a coaching program. We basically have a, a practice management system for doctors to bring functional medicine into their practice and take the guesswork out of it, business management and protocols and science support. So we're excited about that. And that's called Beyond Genetics. And, um, you know, if, if there's any questions, my email, personal email will be out in the, uh, the email that goes out. So just reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Perfect. And will we see you in Minneapolis next month? Are you going to be here for Great Lakes or... I'm gonna it's in the middle of soccer season and I have a big responsibility here. I can't get away, but I will every other, you know, I can probably get out there every other year, but this year is going to be tough. So. Well, and for those who can't make it live either do know that one of the great things about what Nutridyne has done with their education portal is if you can't make it to the live events, we now have this fantastic backend education resource where you can go on, you can log in, you can look at old lectures 30 days or a month or so after Great Lakes wraps, you'll have access to go in and purchase the conference and get your continuing education credits, right? There's a host of amazing continuing ed credits sitting over there in the uh, Nutridyne portal. So do know you've got beautiful resources to have access to. Got some brilliant headliners this year, um, many of which I think some of you have seen on our stage in Nutridyne before. Uh, Dr. Wafay, who was the first IFM certified integrative oncologist in all of the Middle East, um, just had an amazing chat with her a couple of weeks ago. And her practice is just has exploded. Uh, she's teaching all over the world, helping bring in that integrative approach. Uh, we also have our, our home our home team, Jeff Katulski, uh, coming out of Southern Minnesota in Mankato, um, does a lot of work in our region here, supporting integrative oncology movement and patients. Monique Class is flying in from the East Coast. She is here to tell her story. If you did not hear the interview with her in July, where we talked about her recent experiences navigating her recent diagnosis of breast cancer. That was probably one of the most powerful hour sessions I've ever had in these last three years running this program. And so Monique kicked off this program three years ago, talking about hormone balance, came back in July to talk about what she's been through and navigating the system and where healthy lifestyle and diet worked for her. Um, she's a brilliant survivor and has been treating breast cancer patients her whole life. Now she is a breast cancer survivor. And then uh, last is our big headliners. We've got Trisha Paulson, 
I just adore Trisha's teaching style. She came from Canada about 18, 19 years ago. She was my very first resident, worked in my office for about five years, and then moved over to Wisconsin, went for the Packers, uh, dove in over there and has a brilliant practice. Uh, she teaches for Nutridyne and she's got 100% telemed practice. Uh, fabulous uh, implementer of not only nutrition, but she has taught that 48 hour nutrition course in Wisconsin for quite some time. And then do know amazing uh, lineup. We've got all of those extra continuing ed credits that you may need and boundaries and acupuncture. And you're going to dive deeper uh, with our chief science officer, Rick Mayfield. And we'll have a wonderful spectrum of conversation. Uh, Brian Kaufman is going to be there talking a little bit more with all of us about those binders, working with SIBO, working with gut infections. And of course, we've got the anchor of uh, Rob Silverman there. So excited to see all of you who can make it. Uh, those of you who will be there. Last questions. Um, I would have you pop open the Q&A quick, if you don't mind, Andrew. Sure. I think you covered these, but maybe I'm going to have you go back for a minute and just see if there's anything else you want to add in. Yeah. So, I mean, basically the first, one of the easy questions or this more simple one is how do you treat SIBO? And, and really it's just sort of a, it's a, it's a process that takes, in my experience, several weeks, usually somewhere between, I would say on the short end, maybe six weeks up to three or four months. And it, it takes a long time to change bacteria because the it's small intestine is basically Shangri-La for bacterial life. So you're not going to make it a very, you're not going to disinfect the small intestine very quickly or easily because of the, just the, the physiology down there. So SIBO takes, uh, it takes patients who are willing to play ball and go through the process of eating, avoiding foods that feed the infection and the overgrowth and cycling through uh, antimicrobials and working on that upper GI function to break food down and fully assimilate and, you know, break your uh, proteins down into small pieces so you can absorb them correctly. Yeah. Uh, antimicrobials, really, I just use a lot. I mainly, everything in my office is anchored off of Nutridyne. About 90% of what we use is, is out of their catalog. So we use the Spectrum products, AR and BR with really good results. I use a lot of GSE, GSE Pro it's called. Um, there's also some tinctures and, you know, infocytex. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, there's a handful of products available that, 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 that they go together in a package really well. They don't really stack on top of each other. They kind of overlap a little bit, but they each have their own, um, you know, kind of a, effectiveness. And then this other question is a little more, probably more of a nuanced answer. Maybe, maybe not the right place to answer it, but SNPs and, you know, if SNPs and MTHFR and comps are, if the, per if the person has MTHFR and COMT SNPs, elevated SAH and cystathionine and normal SAM, I mean, I would say with that amount of information, what, I, what has always been helpful to me is you go back to that chart that Christy showed That's in the what beginning. I was just going to do. Yeah. You, you literally take an arrow and you write up, down, normal on that chart for this patient. And then you can start to visualize, you know, where the block is. But basically with inflammation, the body upregulates the production of glutathione and sulfur as in response to stress and inflammation. That's what the whole CBS upregulation is. It's an attempt to produce antioxidants like taurine and glutathione to protect yourself from destruction. And so that's why the methylation cycle kicks into transsulfuration so intensely. But those are special cases. Uh, I'm not saying it's not an important question, but that would be, it's going to bore everybody if I just keep going on. So that one-on-one, -on -one. gotcha. Well, thank you for being here. Um, those of you who are with us on the Facebook page, a fresh start with Dr. Christie, will highlight some of the big key clinical takeaways from this conversation. It was awesome. Loved having you here and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you. I know you're heading into Minneapolis. I want to talk a little bit about your AK series coming up, I believe in January. Yeah, we're going to be back live in January. There's no, you know, years back we would have, there's usually 80 to 100 people in this class. It's big. It's well organized. There's no other like AK uh, uh, seminar like it. And it's perfect for anybody who's just literally brand new to AK or been doing it for 30 years. There's always something to learn. So Nutridyne really does put on an incredible, um, well-supported uh, conference. There's four weekends, four modules. You could take one independently, but, you know, they kind of all, they, they sort of flow together. And it's once a month starting in January, running through uh, the end of April, I believe. So yeah, uh, yeah, looking forward to doing that. It's an honor to be able to teach some students something right. valuable. So Wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much. And hope to see many of you uh, next month on a fresh start. And we will uh, see you at our wonderful Great Lakes Conference at the beautiful JW Marriott right next to the airport in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Have a wonderful fall, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.